it's nice you're not on your phone. See a human, not plugged in. It says a lot about you. I like to think so. Hi, Christy, how are you? Hi, so nice to meet you. Hello. Hello, it's nice to meet you too. Um, I love your work. Thank you. <laughs> I know daddy -O is your directorial debut, yes. so it's almost perfect that it's like such a simple setup, and yet nothing is ever simple in Hollywood. No. So what would you say was the most challenging aspect for you? You know, this uh, film is very complex in its simplicity. You think that two people in this contained space would be really easy to just grab a camera and run out and shoot it. Uh, but it, it, it really wasn't. Um, so first I had to think to myself, okay, are we gonna trailer them, right? Um, but it's hard, that's really hard on the cast and crew. It's hard to reset. It would have all been night shoots. Um, and I really wanted to protect the performances. I wanted to make it comfortable. And I also wanted optionality in terms of what we're seeing and what we're not seeing. And so then the next thing, thought that you have is, okay, let's, let's, let's go onto a soundstage. But then you're using blue or green screen. And um, that would have swelled the VFX budget by millions of dollars. It would have actually made this film very unproducible. Uh, so I actually had to do a lot of research uh, and I really stumbled upon this incredible technology where basically you have these LED panels that you surround the cab with. And we actually shot the drive from JFK to Hell's Kitchen on an array car with nine cameras. So then those panels are actually projecting the drive. And it does this incredible thing actually where it makes more of an immersive experience for the cast. So, you know, Dakota would look out the window and she'd actually see, you know, the, uh, the street lights going by or she'd see a car going by. It was really funny for Sean when we got into Manhattan, he was driving and he was like, I got nervous that I was gonna hit some of the pedestrians. <laughs> so it gave them a feeling of time and place, which is great. And then that soft light actually engages with the set. And then Faden Papa Michael, our incredible DP, was able to add hard light on top of that. And then we could be in the monitor and really see what it was gonna be. We could easily reset. Um, so look, this was way more um, technologically demanding than I would have liked my first movie to be. Uh, but I'm also really grateful I got to cut my teeth on it. And now I'm not afraid of it. And I'm happy to, I'm really excited to use it as I move forward as a filmmaker. Oh, that's wonderful. And it must be so gratifying too to have for your first film, like people like Dakota Johnson and Sean Penn wanting actively to work with you. What were those first few meetings like deciding, you know, how we're stepping into these characters? Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm so grateful to both of them for lending themselves to this film. Um, Dakota got attached really early on and also came on board as a producer. Uh, she's the one who said, what do you think about my dear old friend, Sean Penn? So she slipped him the script. He read right away. And then, yeah, you know, um, we really, we did some table reads of it. Um, we did a little light rehearsal, but it was really important not to over rehearse something like this because you really want to preserve those natural reactions and you really want to give them uh, ability to really explore on camera. Um, but we did have a couple meetings where we got together and it was it was really sweet. It was a lot of fun. We, we went to Sean's house, we did some table reads and then at one point it was like, okay, well let's get it up on its feet a little bit just to get a feeling for it. He sets out a chair in front of a couch and he had a pole and he had a hand mirror and he duct taped the hand mirror. Because if you think about it, they're not actually really looking at each other for most of the film. They connect every now and again by way of the rear view mirror. Um, so it was important for them to get a little bit of a feel for that. And so, yeah, he, just, he did this little thing and then they just kind of marked uh, through the script and I was like, I can die now and I can die very happy. This is incredible. I was just, you know, just, just watched it all take place. It was, it was really special. But yeah, we didn't over rehearse it. Um, and then it was just very kind and collaborative, very respectful. They're both word perfect in this movie. They really deliver the script. Um, we just had really wonderful conversations and we had a lot of fun. Uh, it just takes a lot of trust and a lot of joy to do something like this that is so intimate. We also didn't have a lot of time. And so, yeah, we just we just jumped in the deep end and just went for it. Absolutely. I find it so fascinating that like, there's like the dark energy of, you know, an illicit affair happening through the text messages. You know, you just see Dakota's expressions and how they change based on the text she's getting. Yeah. Uh, was that always going to be the case? Did you ever think about doing flashbacks? What made you want to 
relay the information that way. Sure. So originally I wrote a script that was all contained in the cab because that was my original vision for this film. Uh, when this script started getting really passed around in Hollywood, this was back in 2017, I got some feedback from some people that were like, oh, maybe you could expand it a little bit and give it a little more scope. So um, I did, there is a version out there, a draft that, you know, people have passed around where there are these, we never go into another scene with dialogue ever, but we do steal into her memories. We see visions of some of the stuff that she's talking about. But then when it came time, when we got our money and it really came time to go shoot this movie, um, I had a conversation with producers just saying, hey, which version do we all like better? And um, Emma tillinger Koskoff, incredible producer, uh, legend in her own right, I have to say, she just said, you know what, Christy, you're the director of this movie. It's your vision, and we will champion either version, but you need to go away and really meditate on which one you want to do. And I realized that the one with the memories was me satiating some note, but it was never my intention. I really wanted the audience to feel like they were a fly on the wall during this real organic conversation that unfolds before you. So I thought, you know what, let's go back to the original script. And that's what we did. Oh, that's amazing. Now, uh, you're working on It Ends With Us, I, uh, which is like, I, it's so crazy to me. Like that's, <laughs> I'm like, wow, it's such a huge like step for you. That's so cool. But thank you. Um, what is your approach to adapting someone else's work, especially someone as well known as Colleen Hoover? Colleen Hoover is such an incredible writer. I'm a huge fan. So first of all, it was an absolute dream to get that job, to meet her and to sit with her. And my first meeting with her, what I said to her was, you know, because the book is so beloved, um, I assured her that I would try to preserve everything that I possibly could in the book. Um, but novels and screenplays have very different structures. A screenplay has a three-act structure that you really need to honor. And so sometimes you do have to massage or even invent certain things that maybe aren't necessarily in the book. But what I told her was, I want to preserve everything that I can, and then anything that I change or slightly massage or alter, I will do it with the utmost respect. Because the goal always was to be that I wanted audiences, when they're watching the movie, to have the same feeling that they had when they were reading the book, even if there are slight changes between the two. It should still feel like every decision was still in the spirit of the book um, and, and just carrying on the legacy and the torch of what Colleen Hoover has created. I love that. Now, you're working with some incredible uh, young uh, women in Hollywood. Obviously, Dakota, we've got Blake Lively. Yes. Um, is, is there anyone, you know, that you really want to work with next? Or is there any, uh, you know, uh, female perspective that you would like to explore? You know, it's a really exciting time, uh, I think, in Hollywood of like pressing into all these stories that have yet to be told. And so, yeah, I, I really believe we talk a lot about corporate responsibility, but I also really believe in creative responsibility. So um, I'm just excited to, you know, really be one of those voices in town that unapologetically is, you know, just really telling stories um, that I think move the human heart. And you know, you think of daddy -O and you think of It Ends With Us, pressing into subject matter that maybe Hollywood has been a little afraid of or things that make us uncomfortable, but I think it's really important in terms of like, for us to move forward as a society, it's like, these are the kind of stories that we should be telling. So yes, really empowering uh, stories about women, but also I think empowering stories just about the human experience at large. Um, but for me, it ha at the heart of it, I have to know why are we telling this story and why are we telling it right now? And I really, I want to scratch under the scabs of society a little bit and be like, hey, let's lift the hood a little bit and let's, let's kind of poke around in places that we were never really allowed to be and let's just, let's have those conversations because these things are happening in real life. So let's talk about it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I love daddy -o. Thank you. I cannot wait to see what you do next. Oh, <laughs> I really great appreciate day. it. So nice to meet you. Have a good day. Look, at the end of the day, people are people. And people get lonely.